kalam the lisanain is a person having two tongues. A person having two tongues. And scholars explain kalam the lisanain a yatakalam kullu wahidin bi kalamin yuafikuhu. Yuafikuhu. Aw yaiduhu annahu yansuruhu thumma la yansuruhu. Aw yuthni ala wahid fi wajhihi wa yadhammuhu inda al akhirin. The person who has two tongues is an individual who speaks to everybody in a manner that pleases him. He goes out of his way to appease everyone. So he speaks to this one in a manner that makes him happy. He speaks to this one in a manner that makes him happy. Doesn't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. So he speaks to everyone in a manner that appeases them. Or he's someone who promises an individual that he's going to help them and then he never helps them. Always making promises, and these are like politicians, right? They always make a lot of promises, and mostly, almost never fulfill their promises. And also, this is the type of person who praises someone in his face, and then talks about him behind his back to other people. Oh, mashallah, you're this, you're that, and then when he gets around other people, he blames the person, condemns the person, and talks about him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna min, inna ashar al-nas dhi wajhain, alladhi yati ha'ula bi wajh, wa yati ha'ula bi wajh, rawahu al-Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that you will find that the worst people, the worst people are those who have two tongues. Those who have two tongues or two faces. In one narration it says Dhu Lisanain, and another narration it says Dhu Wajhain, a person who has two faces. And we, we use in the English slang, two faced it. The person who has two faces. You'll find him to be the worst type of person because he comes to this group of people with one face, and then he goes to this group of people with another face. If someone is being talked about in a group, then he'll come to that group and he'll talk about that person. And if that same person is being praised in another group, then he will praise that person in another group. This is a person who has two faces, two tongues. And this is a person who you never know, you never can get to the bottom of who he or she is because they never let you pass a certain point. They always give you what they believe you should know about them or believe you should, you know, what you believe, what they believe that you believe about them. So they come at you like that and they never allow you to see who they truly are. Number eight from the dangers of the tongue is that ghiba is backbiting. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in many narrations about the dangers of backbiting. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ya ma'ashara man amana bi lisanihi wa lam yadkhul al-iman fi qalbi. لا تغتاب المسلمين ولا تتبع أوراتهم فإن من تتبع أوراتهم تتبع الله سبحانه وتعالى أوراتهم ومن تتبع الله أوراتهم يفضحه ولو في جوف بيتي. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "O you who believe with your tongues, but true iman has not entered into your hearts. Do not backbite the Muslims. لا تغتاب المسلمين." Don't backbite the Muslims. He said, and don't follow their shortcomings or their mistakes. He said, because the one who follows the shortcomings and mistakes of someone, then Allah will follow his shortcomings and his mistakes. And whoever Allah follows his shortcomings and mistakes, then Allah will expose the secrets of his mistakes, even if those that are done in his own home. Those that are done in his own home. And today, subhanAllah, we are in the habit of, you know, quote unquote, exposing people. I'm going to expose you to the community. And then we go on the internet and we write something about you on the internet. And because we think that it is our duty to expose you to the ummah and make every, let everybody know that this is who you really are. As if we're doing Islam a service. As if we're doing Islam a favor. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family were accused of something that is so grave that even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during that time, the scholars say this is one of his greatest trials and that was that his wife Aisha was accused of adultery. Aisha was accused of adultery. 
Can you imagine you are imam, leader of the community, and then there's a group in the community that don't like you, hate what you're doing, hate what you're propagating, hate what you stand for, and the only way that they can cause damage to you is to ruin your reputation by lying on your wife and accusing her of adultery. Can you imagine? Just imagine yourself as an imam of a community and a group of people in the community, and every community has them. Every community has a group of people in the masjid, and I don't know why they continue to come to the masjid instead of going where their heart finds satisfaction. If that's where your heart finds satisfaction, then go somewhere else. Nonetheless, they choose to stay in the community, stay in the masjid, and they create all types of fitna in the community simply because these are people who just don't like good for anybody, not even for themselves. They don't want good for anybody. Yet and still, they will slander the imam, they will backbite the imam in personal circles, they will do nejwa, they will get certain, they will get specific circles, clandestine circles, secret circles where and they begin to try to thwart the efforts of the imam in the community. But just think about someone accusing your wife of adultery. And the people who accused the Prophet ﷺ's wife of adultery, he knew exactly who they were. It was the chief of the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn as -Salul. He knew exactly who it was. However, when the Prophet ﷺ got on the minbar, he said, who will assist me against those who have harmed me and my family? And he never mentioned his name. He never said who the person was, although he knew who it was. Why, as the scholars mentioned, for many reasons. One of the main reasons is because those who were hypocrites who was following him, perhaps if the Prophet ﷺ did not go to such an extreme with him, perhaps those who were following him were who were not totally, completely hypocrites, that they would eventually make tawbah and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leave off their hypocrisy, stop following him, based upon the way that the Prophet ﷺ treated him. But today, we feel like I have to expose him. And I'm going to get on the minbar and give a khutbah and expose him. I'm going to get on the internet and I'm going to expose him. Husband and wife, or wife is so disgruntled with the way that her marriage went, she feels like it is her God-given duty to get on the internet and expose this man so that he doesn't do it to another woman. And he ends up doing it to another woman anyway because you can't stop that. If a person decides that he is going to take advantage of women, there's really not a lot that we can do because we're not a united front as Muslim community. This imam of this masjid doesn't have a relationship with that imam so much so that we can correlate with one another to make sure that this individual doesn't marry another woman in the community. We don't have that type of solidarity. We don't have that type of unity. We don't have that type of connection. So when you jump out there and say, I'm gonna protect the sisters and I'm gonna put his name on the internet, all you're doing is backbiting an individual because no one is listening to what you're saying. As a matter of fact, even if you put that out there, someone is still going to marry him anyway, even though they know that that is what he did, because they'll think, well, that is you, that's not going to happen to me. But at the end of the day, the harm outweighs the good. The mafsada is ekthara min al maslaha, that the mafsada, the, the detriment, is greater than the benefit. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said that whoever follows the faults of someone, then Allah will follow his faults. And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows his faults, then he will expose him even if it is in the comfort, the mistakes that he makes in the comfort of his own home. It was mentioned in another narration, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغِيبَةِ فَإِنَّ الْغِيبَةِ أَشَدُّ مِنَ الزِّينَةِ وَإِنَّ الرَّجُلْ قَدْ يَزِنُ قَدْ يَزْنِ وَيَشْرَبُ الْخَمَرِ ثُمَّ يَتُوبُ فَيَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَإِنَّ صَاحِبِ الْغِيبَةِ La yukfar lahu hatta yakfir lahu sahibuhu. Subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Iyakum al ghiba I warn you, I caution you against backbiting. He said, because backbiting is worse than zina, is worse than adultery, fornication and adultery. He said, because perhaps the person who drinks khamar, who drinks intoxicants, or perhaps the person who commits zina, Perhaps they will repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah will accept their repentance. He said, but the one who backbites someone, he will not be forgiven for his backbiting until the person he backbit forgives him first. La ilaha illallah. When you backbite someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive you for your backbiting 
until the person you backbit forgives you first. Which means that if you backbite someone, then you are obligated to go to the person and say, I mentioned your name in a manner that I should not have. Please forgive me. And the person can either say, I forgive you, or the person can say, I want my haq from you, yawm al qiyamah. I, I do not forgive you. I do not forgive you. And I will get my haq from you, yawm al qiyamah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a man came to Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, Muhammad Nasr al Din al Albani, and he said, Yes, yeah, Shaykh, oh Shaykh, I've backbit you. I talked about you at, an, at a time where I disliked you, and I mentioned your name in a manner that was not favorable. Forgive me. Shaykh al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, this shows you the mercy of people of knowledge. Knowledge makes you merciful, it doesn't make you more harsh. Some people who kind of validate themselves and justify themselves by how harsh they are with the knowledge that they carry. Knowledge makes you layin, hayin, layin. Knowledge makes you gentle, easygoing, lenient. That's what knowledge does. It softens your heart, not heartened it. Sheikh Labani said to the individual, I forgive you for what you said about me, for what you didn't say about me, and I forgive you, what you for, for what you will say about me in the future. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you for what you said about me, for what you didn't say about me and probably wanted to say, and what you probably will say about me in the future. I forgive you. SubhanAllah. But this shows you that if you backbite someone, you are obligated to go to that person and say, I mention your name. You don't have to say exactly what you said, but you can say, I mention your name in a manner that was not befitting. Please forgive me. And the person can either forgive you or not forgive you. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying here that ghibah is worse than zina in that regard simply because a person can repent from ghibah, a person can repent from zina and drinking khamar but the person cannot repent from backbiting someone until the person you backbit forgives you. And the fact of the matter is that some of us believe that because we are right, <laughs> brother is such and such is, is this and you say, Astaghfirullah, don't say that about the brother. And we say, well, no, it's the truth. As if that justifies you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in ending, he said to his companions, Tadruna mal ghiba. Do you know what backbiting is? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Dhikruka akhaka bima yakra. It's to mention about your brother what he would not like. They said, well, what, what if what you're saying about him is the truth? As if that justifies. What, is, what if what you're saying about him is actually true? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِنْ كَانَ فِي أَخِيكَ مَا تَقُولُ فَقَدْ بَهَدْتَ وَإِنْ كَانَ فِي أَخِيكَ مَا لَا تَقُولُ فَقَدْ He said, فَقَدْ فَإِنْ كَانَ فِيهِ مَا تَقُولُ فَقَدْ اِخْتَبْتَهُ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِ مَا تَقُولُ فَقَدْ بَهَدْتَهُ He said, if what you are saying about him is the truth, then in fact you have backbit him. It's still backbiting, even if it's the truth. He said, and if what you're saying about him is not the truth, then you have slandered him. You have slandered him. So just because what you're saying about the person is the truth, is, it, it is what it is, but it does not justify you for backbiting a person. And the only time that you are justified in talking about someone and what they did is if they do it in public and it becomes public information. When a person does something in public, it is no longer considered backbiting simply because everyone knows about it. But if someone does something in private and only you saw that, or only a group of people saw that, and then you become, you expose that to the world, you expose that to the larger community, then you have bat, bit, bat bit in the person because no one else needed to know about that. But if a person does something in public and everyone knows about it, then it's not considered backbiting, although speaking about it could be from a lagwi or lahwo, uh, speaking about matters that don't concern you, or it could be considered just frivolous talk, which is also haram in Islam. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.